Energy efficiency dominates discussions in the building industry, and each new code cycle increases these energy performance standards. Insulating existing buildings has been a major topic of discussion in the last few years, as upgrading the existing housing stock has been a priority by the Department of Energy, or DOE, with federal grants being given to state and local governments to reduce energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I'm not against energy efficiency by any means, and in fact, I think it's something that we need to continue to strive for in terms of energy independence, not only as a country, but as individuals. But with that said, we need to have a better understanding of the ramifications of energy efficiency as a whole, and how it impacts the design of the building envelope and the types of assemblies that we construct. First of all, we need to define what we mean by energy efficiency. The Department of Energy defines it as the use of less energy to perform the same task or produce the same result. So if we're trying to make homes and buildings more energy efficient, one of the best ways to reduce energy consumption is to insulate more, since the majority of our energy consumption is from heating and cooling. I think this is well understood by homeowners, design professionals, and builders. But what if I told you that insulating can actually reduce durability? When we go to insulate a building, our goal is to reduce the amount of heat loss or heat gain. That's the purpose of insulation. It slows heat flow. However, we need heat flow for drying to occur if the building gets wet, and there are many ways that a building can get wet, whether it's through a bulk water leak, condensation, a plumbing leak, or poorly flashed opening. And it's important to understand that the more we insulate within a cavity space, the less available energy there will be to dry out those assemblies. That's why we can run into moisture issues if we go to insulate an old building haphazardly, as there could be small leaks that have been hidden for decades. We also have to contend with the fact that buildings nowadays are constructed out of a lot more moisture-sensitive materials that are prone to mold growth, like OSB, paper-faced gypsum, laminates, and fast-growing lumber which doesn't have nearly the density or resin content of old-growth lumber that was historically used. Now, I get a lot of questions about the effectiveness of super-insulated double-wall assemblies, Larson truss walls, structural insulated panels, and other systems, and they all can be designed to perform exceptionally but they are all more prone to deterioration if they get wet. Air sealing these assemblies becomes critical, not for the energy efficiency benefits, but to keep them from getting wet since air transport has the potential to deposit moisture. I highly recommend taking the time to look up some of the structural insulated panel failures in Juneau, Alaska, or the SIP roof failure at the PCC Newburgh building. We cannot compromise durability for the sake of energy efficiency, otherwise you're going to be replacing a rotted building in a few years, and that's not exactly a sustainable building practice. There's nothing more sustainable than building something that lasts a long time, and that can be used continuously for generations. There is a way to improve energy efficiency while actually improving the durability of the structure, and that's to insulate on the exterior of the assembly with rigid insulation. This warms the condensing surface of the sheathing and keeps the structure closer to interior temperatures and relative humidity conditions. The rigid insulation also provides a thermal break between the structural components and the exterior environment, preventing heat loss or heat gain through those conductive components. Now, at a minimum, we want to install enough rigid insulation outboard to prevent condensation on the backside of the sheathing, and this amount will vary depending on the climate or microclimate that you're building in, the relative humidity that you're operating under, and the amount of insulation that's been installed interstitially. I'll put up the minimum recommended ratios from Building Science Corporation that were the basis for current building codes, but understand that more is better in this case. If we can install all of the insulation outboard of the sheathing, or almost all of it outboard, this is what we call the perfect assembly. Since since the condensation risks have been eliminated, the structural components are kept warm and at interior temperatures, helping them to dry out if they get wet, and we have virtually no thermal bridging. Now of course the strategy can be expensive, but it's by far the best solution that we have if we want the benefits of both energy efficiency and long-term durability. We actually have some CAD details available on my website for exterior insulation, I'll put a link to those in the description below. Now let's talk about net zero, net positive, and passive house. There are plenty of ways to achieve net zero and net positive energy. It has less to do with the building envelope and much more to do with the ratio of renewables and the amount of energy consumption. But we often use a combination of a well-insulated building envelope to reduce the amount of renewables you need in the first place. Some programs even allow for off-site energy production, so there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Passive House, on the other hand, is a lot more strict and focuses primarily on the building envelope, insulation values, thermal bridging, and air sealing measures, and while all of this is well and good, there's still a tendency to prioritize insulating at the expense of water management and moisture management, and so we have to acknowledge that there's much less room for error in these super-insulated assemblies. There's another component to this, and that's HVAC. Like I said before, if we reduce the amount of heat flow in an 
and out of the building by providing a well-insulated and airtight enclosure, we're going to reduce the demands of the HVAC systems. I already mentioned that heat is needed for drying to occur, but what about air conditioning? In poorly insulated buildings, air conditioners inadvertently functioned as dehumidifiers, as the warm, moisture-laden air from the interior would condense on the coils inside the system, removing it from the air. That's why air conditioners have a condensate line. But by insulating, air conditioner runtime was reduced, resulting in higher interior relative humidity levels since the air conditioner was no longer dehumidifying. So now we have to have dedicated dehumidifiers if we want a reliable means of moisture removal. Then there's the ventilation side of things, and I'm not just talking about exhaust-only ventilation, but fresh air systems like ERVs. ERVs, or energy recovery ventilators, are necessary for any home, whether it's a code-built home or a high-performance home, as they bring in fresh filtered air and expel moisture-laden stale air. The outgoing air tempers the incoming air, so there's some built-in heat recovery, which is useful for avoiding cold air drafts and maximizing energy efficiency. But there's a tendency to overventilate, which not only can result in an energy penalty, but it can result in humidity issues since during the warmer months, the air that's being brought in tends to be more humid than the conditioned air inside, and so we have to make sure that we're ventilating at an appropriate rate relative to the needs of the occupants to keep interior relative humidity at a safe level. So we need to be energy efficient, but we can't compromise integrity and durability of our buildings while doing so. We have to build differently and prioritize water management, as even the smallest leaks can result in mold and premature degradation, especially in newer buildings in which we're using a lot more moisture-sensitive materials. We have to prevent condensation and air leakage that could cause moisture issues while allowing for drying. We have to ventilate at the right rates and ensure that we have a means of moisture removal. Remodels have to be carefully assessed prior to retrofitting the structure with insulation. All of this stuff has to be accounted for and should be integrated into the design process. If you're looking for a guide to retrofitting an existing home with insulation and improving energy performance without compromising durability, get my guide to moisture management for residential remodels in which we discuss how to safely insulate and address a wide range of existing building conditions. That's only available at asiri-designs.com shop. We've also got over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. Make sure to give this video a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.